Well, I hope you had a great Christmas and you're ready to make 2019 your best year ever because here at Cornerstone Fellowship, we're going to do everything we can to help you succeed and also to experience the abundant life that Christ promised all of us. Now, let me remind you, as Lisa already did, that next week is Every One Sunday. On Every One Sunday, we encourage everyone to bring someone to church that normally doesn't come. Now, if you notice, I added something at the last because there's always someone who doesn't bring anyone. And when all, well, I don't always mention it, but they'll make sure because they see that I notice that. They'll always say something like this. Well, I brought my wife to church or I brought my husband to church thinking they're being cute. The problem is they always bring their wife to church or they always bring their husband to church. So I want to make sure that you understand that we want you to bring someone that normally doesn't come to church. Now, if your wife doesn't normally come or your husband doesn't normally come, then by all means, we want you to bring them to church. That counts because they don't normally come. So next Sunday, we want everyone to bring someone to church who doesn't normally come. And the best way to get someone to come with you is to personally invite them. Statistics show that people are more likely to come to church if someone personally invites them. In fact, there's been a lot of research done on that. Do you realize that 83% of the people say that they would come to church if someone would personally invite them? That means that if you invited 10 people and you did it the right way, 8 out of those 10 would probably come to church with you. Now, I know that some of you are introverts and you're uncomfortable with inviting people to church. How many of you consider yourself to be an introvert? And you kind of feel uncomfortable inviting people to church. But I want you to think of it like this. As Christians, we have a responsibility to share the gospel with others. So would you rather share the gospel with others or invite them to church and let me share the gospel with them? Which is easier? So if you don't want to share the gospel with your family, your friends, your neighbors, then invite them to church and I'll share the gospel with them for you. So it's either you share the gospel with them or you invite them to church and I'll share the gospel with them. Now, I know what most of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, well, Pastor Allen, is there a third option? Because I don't want to do either one of those things. Well, I hate to tell you this, but there is not a third option unless you're willing to let people go to hell simply because you don't want to feel uncomfortable. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. And let me show you something interesting. At least it's interesting to me, and it's also a little convicting. Notice what it says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you see that? God is not willing that any should perish, but instead, he wants everyone to repent and be saved. Now, I want you to notice the word willing. God is not willing that any should perish. Now, the Greeks had two different words for willing. Thelo and bulomai. Thelo refers to an impulsive and unconscious desire. It's kind of a spur-of-the-moment whim. Bulomai refers to a rational and conscious desire. It's a premeditated choice or decision. Now, let me see if I can explain the difference between the two. If fellow was used in this verse, it would imply that God didn't really put much thought into it. But if he had to pick one over the other, then what the heck? God wouldn't want anyone to perish, but instead he'd want them to be saved. Sure, why not? It's really not that important to God, but hey, he'd rather have that than the other alternative. That's what fellow would imply. But if bulamai was used in this verse, it would imply that God put a lot of thought into it. And he came to the calculated decision that he doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Not one person. Instead, he wants everyone to repent and be saved. And this wasn't a flippant choice that he made in the heat of the moment, but it's something that's really important to God. Now, hopefully you see the difference between the two, but I'm going to go a little bit further. And I'm going to use my children as an example to show you the difference between Thelo and Bulomai. When Micah Joy was four years old, she could already read. Lisa had worked with her. She knew her alphabet. We worked on phonics. She started sounding out words. And before we knew it, she was reading on her own. Now, when Christmas came and she was four years old, she already knew what Christmas was about. We told her it was about Jesus. But really, in her mind, it was about getting presents. 
So on Saturday, she would watch cartoons and we would let her do that. And when the commercials would come on, there was always a commercial about a toy. And we would hear, no matter where we were in the house, her screaming, Mom, Dad, I want that. Come here, come here. I want you to see. I want that. And of course, we'd pick her, we would poke her head in there and go, okay, I see that, honey. But I went a little bit further. I said, now, honey, Santa Claus is not going to bring you all the things that you want. So you're going to have to choose what you really want. Well, back in the day, you probably don't remember this if you're young, but you used to get a Sears catalog. Remember, everyone remember the Sears or the Ward's catalog? And she found out that there was a toy section in there. And let me tell you, she spent hours going through it. And she came to me one time and she showed me all these things she wanted. I said, well, honey, I'm just going to be honest with you. You're not going to get all of those. You're going to have to pick what you really want. So she studied it. And she came back with four or five things she really wanted. Now, I want you to understand. Every time she saw a commercial, whatever she saw, that was just kind of a whim. She wanted that. That's fellow. But when she sat down and really thought about it and thought, what do I really want? That's Bulomai. Now, I want you to look back at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And let me ask you, which Greek word do you think is used in this verse? Thelo or Bulomai? Notice what it says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, is Thelo used in this verse or Bulomai? What do you think? Well, you're right. It's Bulomai. So this tells us that whether a person goes to hell or not is important to God. Very, very important to God. In fact, he's not willing that anyone should perish, but that everyone come into repentance and they're saved. Now, here's what's sad. Whether or not a person goes to heaven or hell is extremely important to God. So important that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross and to suffer in hell for three days and three nights in order that we might be saved. So important that God has delayed fulfilling his promise just so that he can give people a little bit more time before Jesus returns. That's what verse 9 is saying. Yet for us, it's not that important. In fact, we're willing to let someone go to hell without ever hearing the gospel just because we don't want to feel uncomfortable. Think about it. God's not willing that anyone should perish. He's not willing to let someone go to hell without doing everything that he can in order to bring them to salvation. People, that's God. But we, on the other hand, we're willing to let someone go to hell simply because we feel uncomfortable. Simply because it's kind of awkward. To ask someone to come to church with us. Well, dang, pastor, you're really laying a guilt trip on us. No, I'm not. Really, I'm not. I just want you to see the difference between us and God. God's not willing that any should perish, so he's gone to extreme lengths to do all he can in order to save us. But we're willing to let people go to hell simply because we don't want to feel uncomfortable. Do you see the difference? So what are you telling us, Pastor Allen? I'm telling you that sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone because some things are too important to allow discomfort to keep you from doing what you're supposed to. And presenting the gospel is one of those things. Whether a person goes to heaven or hell is too important to keep us from sharing the gospel simply because we feel uncomfortable. Now, believe it or not, I'm giving you a way out. I'm telling you that if you're uncomfortable sharing the gospel with others, then invite them to church. And I'll present the gospel for you to them. Now, if you're visiting for the first time, you're probably thinking, dang, this pastor is brutal. He's making me feel guilty. And I don't like it. I'm a snowflake and I want a safe place. Well, let me just say this. Cornerstone Fellowship is not a safe place. We are not the Unitarian Church. There are not many ways to the top of the mountain. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And we tell you that if you're living in homosexuality, or you're living together, if you're doing all of these things, that's okay, God loves you, and you can still go to heaven. No, we're not going to tell you that. 
You want to know why? Because it's not true. It's not true. If you noticed in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, he wants everyone to come into repentance. Because repentance precedes salvation. Now, let me tell you a funny story to lighten things up a little bit to help you uh, kind of get through this, but also to help you understand a little bit about me. Because I know right now you're thinking, my gosh. When my nephew Ryan was first dating his wife, he wanted to make sure that she was a Christian and that she went to church. So he asked her if she uh, went to church anywhere. And of course, she's from Miami, Oklahoma. We're not going to hold that against her. And she was going to NSU at the time. So she really couldn't go to church at home. She didn't go home on weekends. So she was visiting some of the churches. And she told Ryan, well, I've gone to Cornerstone Fellowship a few times. But I'm not sure I really like it because the pastor's kind of aggressive. Well, Ryan was laughing so hard he could barely get it out that the pastor was his uncle. And if you know Ryan, Ryan couldn't wait to tell me. Oh, no, he couldn't wait. But he didn't want to tell me unless she was with him because he's a little bit honorary. And he has that mean streak in him. And he wanted her to be there when he told me what she said. So when he told me, she turned beet red and she said, I didn't mean that to be offensive. With a serious look on my face, I said, well, I am offended. I'm offended because I'm not kind of aggressive. I am aggressive. (laughs) There is nothing kind of about me. I'm not kind of fat, I'm fat. (laughs) I'm not kind of bold, I'm bald. Listen to me. If I'm going to do something or be something, I'm all in, 110%. And at that moment, I burst out laughing because that tickled me. People, I don't get offended, and that's what I told her. So that doesn't offend me at all. You need to understand something. If you want to offend me, you need to purposely tell me, now I'm trying to offend you. Because you're going to walk away saying, I bet he got the point. Nine times out of ten, I didn't. (laughs) I just always expect the best. So, if you're visiting for the first time, let me tell you something about myself. I don't see myself as condemning or judgmental. I see myself as being brutally honest. I'm going to tell you the truth because that's what you need. You need the truth. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it and I'm not going to dumb it down because you're much too intelligent for that. I'm going to tell you the way it is and I'm going to tell it to you in love. Especially when it comes to matters that are really important. And nothing is more important than sharing the gospel with others. Because the gospel has the power to save people. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. In other words, everyone. See, from the Bible's perspective, there's two categorizations or two categories. You have the Jews and you have the, the Gentiles. So when you talk about the Jews or the Gentiles, it's talking about everyone. But here's what I want you to see. The gospel has the power to save people. Now, in order to be saved, it must mean that we're lost. And we are. But the good news, and that's what gospel means, is that we can go to heaven. We can be saved. And as a result of that, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you right up front, there is no other way to get to heaven besides Jesus And because of that, I am not ashamed to tell you that and to tell you that I'm saved. But if people never hear the gospel, then they can't be saved. In fact, notice what Romans chapter 10 verses 13 and 14 says. Here's what it says. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now you need to understand, if you take this in context, that this is referring to calling on him in the right way. This is Romans chapter 10. Everyone's familiar with Romans chapter 10 if you grew up in church. Because in Romans chapter 10, Paul tells us how to be saved. It's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, that's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then he goes further in verse number 11 and talks about not being ashamed of the gospel because it's for everyone. That's in verses 11 and 12. And then he gets to verse number 13. This is where we're picking it up. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In other words, everyone who believes in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord. Because what we confess to, we're committed to. We'll be saved. That's what verse 13 is saying. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then he goes further. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? People, for someone to be saved, they have to believe in Jesus. But how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? You know, the worst thing about my job is having to do funerals. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't mind doing a funeral. Someone lived a life for Jesus Christ. If I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved and I know exactly where they are, those type of funerals are wonderful because all, really all you're doing at a funeral is celebrating their life. But the truth is the majority of funerals that I have to do are for people who are lost and they're going to hell. I know they're not saved. Everyone in the, the, that uh, has a knowledge of Jesus Christ probably knows they're not saved. And I have to be honest, I always wonder when I'm doing the funeral of a lost person, why didn't someone tell them about Jesus? But here's what's worse. That's exactly what that, la that lost person is wondering when they're in hell. They're wondering as they're burning in hell, why didn't someone tell me about Jesus? Turn to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it said. Jesus said, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll notice this is in red. Because Jesus said it. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendid, splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay down there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. And you guys think that I sometimes go into too much detail. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. Why did he go to be with Abraham? Because Jesus Christ had not yet died and been resurrected and ascended to heaven. So before that time when people died who were believing in the Messiah... They didn't go to heaven because Jesus hadn't taken captivity captive yet. So when they died, they went to a place called the bosom of Abraham. The reason it was called the bosom of Abraham is because the Jews believed that every person who died looking for the Messiah, they went to this place where Abraham was and he greeted each person with a hug. So they referred to it as the bosom of Abraham. Let's keep going. The rich man also died and was buried. And his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. Now remember, as I said, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, if a person died, if they were looking for the Messiah, they didn't go to heaven, they went down to a place called Hades. But Hades had two different compartments, two different chambers. One was the bosom of Abraham, and it was a place of comfort. The other was a place of torment. And there was a chasm between the two. In one place you were comforted, in the other place you were tormented. Now that Jesus Christ has died when a person and, and, and been resurrected and ascended to heaven, now if a person dies and they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, when their soul is separated from their body, their body goes into the grave, but their soul goes to heaven to be with the Lord. If a person's not a Christian, their soul is separated from their body, their body is buried, their soul goes to hell. Everyone with me? At this time, Jesus is telling this, they both went to the same place, but there were two different chambers. One was a place of comfort, one was a place of torment. So, the rich man also died and was buried, and his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, what we know as hell, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham! No, 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 he's not his father. Just because he was born a Jew doesn't mean... That he believed in the Messiah. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, 
Remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. You see, they weren't. They weren't, one wasn't in heaven and one wasn't in hell simply because one had a bad life and one had a really good life and now they're paying for that. No, no, no. This tells us why. One lived for God, one didn't live for God. One looked for the Messiah, one didn't look for the Messiah. Today we know who that Messiah is, is Jesus. Today you either believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, that he died for your sins, that God raised him from the dead, and that he's ascended to heaven. Or you don't believe that. Those who believe get to go to heaven. Those who don't believe go to hell. That's what you need to see. Then he goes further. No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and they'll turn to God. But Abraham said if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead, which someone did, which was Jesus. Now, obviously this is a parable. It's a story that's used to illustrate a spiritual truth. In this case, it's illustrating what happens to a lost person when they die. In other words, what's it, what is it going to be like for those who wind up in hell? Now, remember that parables are allegorical in nature. That means that the people, things, or events in the parable have symbolic meaning. Now, here's what's interesting about this specific parable. The rich man in this parable is symbolic. He represents unbelievers. But what he experiences in the afterlife is not symbolic. In other words, he is a fictional character, but what he experiences in this story is factual. And it's exactly what lost people will experience when they die. So we're getting a first-hand experience or a first-hand look at what it's going to be like for those who go to hell. Now, I want you to notice that when the rich man died, his soul went to hell, but he remained fully conscious of his surroundings and his past life on the earth. Look at verses 23 through 25 again. And his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the, the, the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. Now, verse number 24 tells us that the rich man experienced intense pain. Notice that it says that he was in anguish. The word anguish is translated from the Greek word adunao, which means intense pain. So he was able to feel just as if he had a physical body. In fact, all of his five senses were working. He could see He could hear, he could touch, he could taste, he could smell. You see, when you die, your soul is separated from your body until the resurrection occurs. Your body goes into the ground, it begins to corrupt, it's rotting away. But one day when Jesus returns, that body will be resurrected, reunited with the soul. But here's what's interesting. When your soul separates from your body... Your soul still has use of all five senses. I don't understand how it works. I don't know. Maybe it's like a person who has a limb amputated. You know, they tell me if a person's limb is amputated, sometimes they still have an itch. And maybe they don't have a foot, but they feel like their foot is itching. And they want to scratch it. Or maybe they feel pain, but there's really nothing there. I I don't know what it's like. But I can tell you this. The Bible tells us that when a person dies... There's a spiritual body that's there. And the soul can have use of all five senses. It can see, it can hear, it can touch, it can taste, and it can smell. He also maintained his memory, if you noticed. In verse 25, Abraham told him to remember his past life. So his memory was intact. 
He knew that he had five brothers and he could remember everything that had ever happened while he was here on this earth. But the worst thing about his predicament was that his eternal destiny was fixed the moment he died. In other words, there was nothing that he could do to get out of hell. People, there is no such thing as purgatory. No such thing. We don't merit the merit of Christ. Some of you were raised Catholic and you were taught that we merit the merit of Christ. No, we don't. Christ has done the work for us. We put our faith in him. We will be judged as Christians for what we did on this earth. But it's not a judgment in which we receive punishment. It's a judgment to see what rewards we will receive. Because the judgment has already been paid in Jesus' body. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His soul descended into hell to pay the penalty for our sins. But what you need to understand, once you die, your eternal destiny is fixed. If you go to heaven, you'll always be in heaven with the Lord. If you go to hell, there's no way out. There's nothing you can do to get out of it. Notice that Abraham told the rich man that there was nothing he could do to help him. Abraham wasn't lying. Abraham told him the truth. There's not a thing I can do to help you. Look at verses 25 and 26 again. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted. Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. And if you think the chasm was great when people went to the bosom of Abraham and to hell, the chasm is even greater now because one goes to the center of the earth and the other goes to heaven. But he says here, besides there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. In other words, once you're in hell, no one can help you. You're on your own. Your eternal destiny is fixed. And you don't burn up. The Bible tells us from the time Jesus Christ comes and the believer's body is resurrected and redundant. So there's a period of, of a thousand years known as the millennium. At the end of that millennium, there's going to be the second resurrection. It's referred to as the resurrection of the damned. Everyone who so went to hell their body will be resurrected too, reunited to their soul. They'll stand before God at the great white throne judgment. They'll be judged out of the books. And then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. And that's referred to as the second death. But even then, their body won't burn up. So their eternal destiny is fixed. But here's the main thing that I want you to see. All right? The rich man didn't want others to end up in hell like he had. In fact, in verses 27 and 28, he wanted Abraham, Abraham to send someone back to warn his brothers about this place. Look at those two verses again. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. You see, once the, once the rich man experienced hell... All of a sudden, he was mission-minded. He desperately wanted someone to warn the people on earth about hell. More specifically, he wanted someone to warn his brothers. Now, if the rich man was thinking that someone needed to warn others about hell, you know he had to be thinking, why didn't someone warn him? Why didn't someone tell him about Jesus? You know, several years ago, I did, well, I'll just, I, I didn't do it. I officiated. I officiated the sermon of a friend of mine that I graduated high school from. I'm not going to give you his name. But as far as I know, he never, ever went to church. Parents never went to church. He'd never been to church. I don't know if anyone had ever shared the gospel with him. And he was a cousin of my wife. And so every time Easter would come up, we would always encourage people to write down the name of five people and pray for those five people and invite them to church. And he was always on my wife's list. And every year, my wife would call him up. And she would say, it's Easter time. I'm calling you again. 
I'd just like to personally invite you to come to church for Easter. And he would always say the same thing. Well, I just might come. Don't be shocked if you see me. But he never came. And every time I would see him, whether in Walmart or maybe at a ball game, I'd sit down and I would talk with him and I'd almost said his name. And I'd say, will not you come to church? I'd sure like to have you. And he'd always say the same thing. Alan, one day I'm going to shock you. I'm going to come to church. But I should have pushed it. I really didn't ask him the right way. I should have said, why don't you come to church? I'll meet you in the, in the foyer. I'll march you down and you can sit with my wife. And after church, I'll take you to lunch. I'll pay for your lunch. I didn't do it. They found him sitting in his recliner. They don't know if he had a stroke or a heart attack, but that's how he passed away. And when I had to officiate his service, I had extreme guilt. Because I knew he had never gone to church. He was not going to go to church. And no one had told him about Jesus. And it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him whom they've not believed? And how can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And no one ever told him. The truth is, I don't want to be guilty of not telling people about Jesus. I don't want to have other people's blood on my hands. But I want to make some application here because I've talked about me, but I want you to be able to apply this to your life. Are your parents saved? Well, I don't know, Pastor Allen. Well, it's too important not to know. It might be very uncomfortable to sit down and talk with them. But let me tell you, nothing is like the pain of attending their funeral and thinking their eternal destiny is fixed. Did they believe? Well, how could they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? So, well, Pastor, I, I don't know if I get it right. Well, you can invite them to church. Are your siblings saved? Every one of my siblings is saved with the exception of one. And trust me, I told that one about Jesus a lot. My mama told him about Jesus a lot. My dad has told him about Jesus a lot. And yet even now, I'm telling you, I just pray that I'll have another chance to tell him about Jesus. Even more chances. But if you have siblings... How are you going to feel when you attend their funeral? And you don't know where they are. Well, Pastor, I don't want to feel uncomfortable. Let me tell you, there's a worse feeling than feeling uncomfortable. And some things are too important not to step out of your comfort zone. And if you don't feel like you can adequately do it, then invite them to church. And let me tell you, you can always preface it with this. I love you so much. I'm willing to offend you and tell you, I want you to come to church with me. If they know you're asking out of love, rarely will you see them get angry. Every once in a while you will, but let me tell you, let them get angry. Are your friends saved? If you don't know and you feel uncomfortable sharing the gospel with them, invite them to church. Because if you're uncomfortable sharing the gospel with others, if you invite them here, I promise you, I will share the gospel. Now, you all know that I'm like, not like most pastors. Every one of my sermons is not a salvation message. This is a rarity. Most of the time... I'm teaching on things that will help you in everyday life. How to have a better marriage, how to parent your children, raise godly children, how to overcome at work, how to be happy. 
But here's what's interesting. At the very end, I'm always going to give an altar call. I'm going to spin off of what I've done. And I'm going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ very, very quickly. And let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit always moves. Because if you teach the word of God, it doesn't matter what you teach on. If you're teaching the word of God, people are convicted. There's a spirit of adoption. The anointing comes. And people start giving their hearts to Jesus. In 2018, we had 129 adults raise their hand to accept Jesus Christ here at Cornerstone Fellowship. We had 127 middle schoolers and high schoolers. Now, when we did our 2018 video, we didn't even count children. Because sometimes with children, they'll raise their hand more than once. You ever notice that? But we had 290 kids raise their hands. We had a total of 546 at least say that they made a profession of faith. And I can't tell you the number of people that get saved at our church, and I'll see them in Walmart or someplace else, and they'll come up and say, I heard the gospel at your church, I got saved, but I'm going with my mama here, or I'm going with my brother here. I'm going. And I always tell them, great, but you make sure you're in church. We don't always keep the people that get saved here, and that doesn't matter. What matters is that they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're saved. You know, my mom was always telling people about Jesus as a child. It just embarrassed me to death. I'd always think, oh, come on, mom. Don't embarrass me when she'd ask. Randy Groot. Randy, do you go to church anywhere? You want to go to church with us? And then she'd sit down and tell them about Jesus. But I can't tell you how great it is as an adult Having Burl, we always called Randy Group Burl. Burl come up and say, you know, your mom always invited me to church and share Jesus with me. I never did accept Jesus with her. But one day Mr. Richardson did and I got saved because your mama laid the groundwork. And he said, my brother David saved as a result of that. My brother Terry saved. My sister Karen is saved. And my mom got saved. But how can they believe if they don't hear? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? Now, next week, I'm going to talk about making decisions. Because there are some decisions you have to make. They're really important decisions. You know, we make a hundred decisions every day. Are you going to brush your teeth or not brush your teeth? Hopefully you brush your teeth. Are you going to floss or you're not going to floss? Well, when's my next cleaning appointment at the dentist? You know, you're making a hundred decisions every day. And many of them are not important, but some of them are very important. And sometimes we think, boy, those are hard decisions. But they're really not. And I'm going to show you why they're not. If you know certain things. If you have children, they're going to be faced with making some important decisions. And you don't want them to make the wrong decision. So I'm going to show you what you need to do to make sure that your children make the right decisions. But let me tell you what I'm going to do next week. At the very end, after I'm teaching on that, I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to say for everyone here, there's a very important decision that you have to make. The most important decision in your entire life. Because it will determine your eternal destiny. And that decision is, what are you going to do with Jesus? If you receive Jesus, if you put your faith in him and make him Lord of your life, you get to spend eternity with God the Father and his kingdom. But if you reject Jesus, you'll be forever separated from God. 